Okay. So I tried to speed up, but uh, I prepared it like 30 minutes, and now I hear I should do it in maybe 20 minutes. But <laughs> um, first of all, I think it is a it's a pleasure to be here because also uh, some years ago, like 15 or years ago, I was also a student of uh, Silos. And then together with Ole Baumann, for instance, we also wanted to have international debates on architecture, and at that time we organized the Invisible in, Ar in Architecture. And in fact, that tradition, which started with Stephen Luracker before my generation, that it's very good to see that a tradition of every two years with collaborators like Ari Graafland, etc., with the school, Silos always manages to pull off every two years, more or less a kind of international debate and discussion on architecture. So it's really a pleasure for me to be here, and I thank Silos and Edwin for organizing that and inviting me. Uh, what I will do in my talk is that I will address more or less three things. First of all, I will talk about what I see as the qualities and how I feel close to the approach of the projectors. Uh, I think also that the projectors fulfilled a kind of paradigmatic gap. There was a kind of lost generation which didn't have the trouble or felt associated with the critical, but in fact uh, wanted to step on a new bandwagon, and the projectors was providing that. But that, of course, has a lot of risks. It, it's a helpful tool to oppose the critical, the criticality towards the projectors, but, and that provides in a new spectrum to find a new answer but it should not be an ism. Uh, it may be a kind of side mark, but in education it's a very helpful tool to have that kind of uh, dichotomy between the two. What I actually make, uh, miss in the project that has been for formulated uh, mostly in the States, and I'm very happy now the word political starts to be mentioned and was mentioned today this morning, not by Mike, Michael Six so much, but by Bob and Sarah, is that there are a lot of misreadings of the idea of the, of the political, or what the political is, and uh, what that political could be. And I think it's an essential thing, or what Sarah said, what could be the political of the collective, I think is a very essential, or maybe hidden agenda, which is within the project of the projectors. And I will try to address that. Uh, but first, I, I want to summarize, and maybe it ha has already been said, but I have prepared, I want to mention a few qualities of this projected project. And uh, what you could say, and also St. Ellen said it, that in fact the projected uh, is not something new. It was already Walter Benjamin who speaks about the fact that criticism must change and the model for this change is the advertisement, or simply anything that creates a perceived contact with things. Like advertising, or in other words, the space of the street, says Benjamin, this new approach beyond critique must touch and fascinate its readers, because they are touched by it, blown away by it, or simply warmed by the subject. Uh, so what the people desire is very much, should very much be addressed. So in a more theoretical sense, Benjamin tells us that a new approach, like advertising, should affect the reader with serial projections of fragmented intensity, which circumvent any form of contemplation. This intensity is something like a burst of energy, which affects the very life of the subject. And also, besides Benjamin, there's also a lot of thought of people like Gilles Deleuze, which in fact uh, influence and also some words of what the projectors is standing for. What is good about the projectors is that it engages the real. In that sense, it wants to be popular, hopes to communicate with the public at large. Instead of looking for truth in architecture or running the risk that it paralyzes itself, the more she knows about how corrupt society is without developing to to know what to do about it. The projectors experiment with reality. Complicity is the only option for architecture, and we should not regret, regret that kind of corruption. Making your hands dirty, 
operating in reality. Trying to transform the real is the only option you have as a practitioner when you want to operate in the real. Any retreat into the autonomy of architecture, trying to save society from its vulgar influences, looking it up, locking it up in the space of the academia or the museum is not what the projectors advocate. The advice of the philosopher Adorno, that is, if the everyday world is corrupt, then there is only one thing that aesthetic experience can do, and it distance itself from reality, so as to guarantee a pure aesthetic promise. It's something which the projectors experiences as claustrophobic. For critical architecture, the social function of architecture consists in having no function, as Adorno would say. Such a negation of reality was meant to arouse resistance and rebellion in the political field. Something I somehow can only understand as a kind of sadomasochism. There is the impossibility of constructing the real, and the only thing you can do is make a better and better analysis of the real, how corrupt it is. But the more you know, the less you can do about it, because they don't have a project to change it. So it's a strange kind of sadomasochism, because on the one hand, you, you analyze what you hate, uh, but on the other hand, you constantly continue to talk about it, instead of trying to do projects. So, critical architects in a preferred manner enjoy the impossibility of the real, instead of trying to project a better world. Instead of letting fly at reality with a priori attitudes like the critical, Projective practices analyze the fact in the hope that the micro decisions taken in a projective project creative process can transform a project in a very concrete and specific way. The criterion here is a passion for extreme reality. Maybe you have noticed that with my images I'm not trying just to illustrate, sometimes you see a critique in it or I try to engage you also to look further or even already see the problems of some interpretations of the project the projectors, like in this image, for instance, there, uh, that there's even a, something said that theory is no longer important. Go on and be a tiger. Uh, this architecture, this projective architecture, is not driven by an ide ideology, a pre presupposed idea, but by the data discovered in reality. The focus is hence on charting reality in the form of diagrams, ideology has been replaced by pragmatic action. A projected practice does not want to stand at the sideline, but right in the midst of mass culture, where we locate and negotiate our possibilities. A projected practice opts for direct involvement. It seeks contact with the user and prefers easy rather than difficult forms of communication. Textbooks or experts telling you how you should understand architecture are disqualified. And also what you see that even if you make a very complicated project like Liebeskind did in his museum, that in the end it will be read and, in, and taken by mass culture anyway in a different manner, and then the project, even your intention, won't work either, as we see here in this advertisement of the Jewish Museum. Another quality of the project that I see is that commodification and liberation can go together. So, in that sense, the dialectical model of the good versus the bad makes no sense. It's earlier about how you can, through, for instance, the media, or even through branding, or advertisement, or through cliches, can develop a certain agency which arrives at liberating assemblages. So perhaps you've seen this image, although it's full with cliches, that somehow the way that people meet here, that somehow an alternative kind of relation or new liberties exactly by the conventions are being opened up the way they come together. So it's much more thinking about relations that are established than thinking about the formal language itself of the object itself. You have really to look to the matters of concern and for that you can use a huge scala of languages. So it's not stuck to a very specific language only. You have to look to the agencies and what it performs, what the demands are, instead of looking to the language itself only. Another thing is that the problem with 
a lot of theory of criticality is that you first develop all kinds of keywords which help you to look to the reality, but those keywords no longer help you then when you look through the fact kind of frame to, to really see what the immediate life, what the real life is constantly negotiating and finding. So when you deal with the real, the way it unfolds, the lived experience, there's a kind of immediacy which you cannot grasp by a kind of theory from above. Because through the lens of a certain fixed theory, like criticality, you don't discover those unknown facts which go beyond your existing categories. And that's also something Williams was pointing to. I think, and they, they don't talk so much about that, uh, the, the people who define the projectors, is that in fact it is about populism. So it is, how could you connect again to what is popular? For most of us, of course, the popular has a negative connotation. Populism is detected as anti-elite, cheap, irrational, folkloristic, and dangerously superficial. But what we share as group is of essential importance for every society. Whatever political system you choose, a democracy or a dictatorship, they all have to deal with a certain idea of the collective or a certain notion of the popular. The question is not, is populism bad or good? But what kind of political logic of the public do we construct in our project? And Sarah Whiting was also hinting to that. And I think that's the issue. What I find, find that, for instance, a problematic project is this project by Fat Art Architects, uh, by here in uh, Rotterdam, in Hoogvliet, where uh, it more has to do with a kind of populism in box office terms. So it is trying to be popular instead of becoming popular. And I think you should not think in ratings, you should not think what the people already know, what already exists as a kind of cliche, but you have to become popular. Uh, I think the projectors is what you could say a kind of 60s movement. Because like the theorist and also hippie Jules Deleuze and his colleague Felix Vatari, it abhors any form of totalitarianism. In accordance with its practice, the human mind and body may not be terrorized in any way by institutional systems. It opts for open systems that are preferably in motion, experiments with preconceived norms. Deleuze and Quattari propose a logic that takes the middle as its starting point, or what you could say is the popular also, that operates through the middle, through a coming and going, concentrating on the in-between, where the line or the curve prevails over the point. For this they use the image of the rhizome, as you probably know. Central to their theory is the optimistic reading of man as a positive pleasure-seeking machine, capable of accomplishing the most positive connections possible in each unique situation. It's an appeal for active participation and the constant process of becoming without any form of discipline. Various critiques of the work of Deleuze mention that celebrating infinite differences does not guarantee liberation. Contemporary capitalism has bid farewell to totalizing standardization. Digital capitalism has itself, I think, become delusion. The carnival-like quality of daily life now ensures high profits through the permanent revolution of its own order. So in embracing heterogeneity in the infinite relationship that an intelligent system can generate, afraid of choosing a wrong direction as modernism, communism and modernism, they really made a direction, but you could say that the contemporary and many projective practices don't dare to take a stand, they just add up the many, many contradictions we also see in late capitalism. So there is a danger in the projective that is hoped to make open systems where many interpretations are possible, but in fact they don't qualify what openness is more important or what kind of different differences you should produce. So the critique applies to the Deleuze's body of thought is equally something uh, which you could apply to those projective practices. The dilemma is that once the progressive potential of the rhizome, the idea of heterogeneity, 
in contrast to what Deleuze and others were hoping, does not at all make people free in late capitalism, but makes them actually dependent on the economical, correct, resomatic system. I had had a small part, but that I will cut. There is for me something very peculiar, what happens a lot in American architectural theory, that when ideas, for instance from Europe, cross the Atlantic, that somehow the political drowns into the sea. And what we see a lot is there's a lot of talk about formal systems, uh, about procedures, etc., etc. They are very intelligent. They uh, they are often much better formulated and polemically described that we perhaps are able or are doing in Europe. But I think it hardly ever talks about life itself or how architecture as a communication to what it performs for the real life out there. So somehow, I think, the political or the social always drops out. So choosing your enemy, when you choose your father, Eisenman, as your enemy, he already took functionalism or functions and the program out of architecture. Once you see him as your enemy, who defines a certain kind of critique in architecture, then you run the risk that you forget the programmatic to include that in your language of architecture. So, for instance, in the work of Farrah Whiteley and Ron White, I like the work, I like the experiment, but what I see, it runs the risk to say formal. Because it doesn't really address, or maybe I don't know it, maybe it's my ignorance, but it's for me unclear how this formal language actually is able to interfere in the everyday life patterns. Perhaps it's also what, what Bob was mentioning, the problem of the artichoke. It stays too more, much on the, on the formal level. It's not a thinking where the form and the performance, I think, in and together, as a kind of quasi-object, produces relations and allows certain demands to establish. Now, I told a bit about it, but... Uh, I won't talk about the problematic coup of Phil, Sylvia Levin, which I think she's totally apolitical, and luckily uh, Bob Samoa and Sarah Whitney are not. I think the dilemma we have, the problem we face with projective practices is in fact the problem you see here. And that is that we have all kinds of heterogeneities. We add all kinds of things on top of each other. It's very intelligent, like Michael Speak said, it's design intelligence. We add all kinds of worlds on top of each other, cliches. Uh, etc., etc. But in fact, what you can see in this projected landscape is that although it's heterogeneous, there are all kinds of conflicts, there are all kinds of shocks, subversiveness, is that it in fact is very conventional. Because, for instance, the, the image of the woman is a pornographic image, it's an aesthetic image, it's fashionable, it surprises you, it's high and low culture, etc., etc. But in the end, it's a very problematic idea of what sexuality is and also what a woman is. And the same counts for is this the Netherlands, this shacking up of windmills and dune landscapes? I think this is not going far enough and, and that's why I call it fresh conservatism. And it's, it's not only counting for men, we see the same, for instance, or, uh, for women, but also the same problem with uh, manhood it happens. So, in fact, I think with fresh conservatism, uh, we face four kinds of problems, you could say. One is that or one trick of this projective practice can be the joke. And this joke or this heterogeneity of adding things together through the joke, that could be fine, but if the joke is not unfolding a secret, reveals no secret, uh, then it's just a subversive game like the Benetton as. Another example is that idea of the collection. You see a lot of catalogs of everything or a lot of data put together and that we also saw in the Dutch Pavilion or in Hanover. But this endless adding up of all kinds of information from politics to fashion, etc., etc., you cannot name it or it is in without classifying it, without taking a position in relation to this heterogeneity I think is highly proper, problematic in our current time. So besides the joke which doesn't reveal a secret, 
or the collection or the catalogue which doesn't, doesn't want to classify it, it, its content. There's the other problem that a lot of architecture, as long or when it is relational, it is already correct. So, for instance, in the work of Lars Feilbrook, it's a new kind of architecture and it establishes many relations that people have to vote over internet and then you, ha you have a new kind of power in the city of Dutesham which tell you if the people that they are in a hate mood or in a love mood, etc., etc. But as a project already is rela relational, then it seems to be okay. And I think that's not enough. Another fourth approach is the one of the mystery. And then I don't mean a kind of enigmatic mystery which uh, has a real confrontational effect or opens up a secret or new possibilities. But at the times of like Hefzik and Moore, they use a kind of mystery as a kind of typology, a kind of an analogy without arising at a kind of political project in relation to the museum, in relation to the city, etc. So in my view, this kind of four heterogeneous way of creating conflict or contradictions, in fact, are an apolitical project. They, according to me, generate a kind of consensus. So what I'm looking for, and, and that's the last part, is uh, whatever happens to those experiments in which heterogeneous conflicts do have a progressive direction. So can we develop open systems within the everyday which also have a social directionality? That, in fact, is my question, or that could maybe be answer, according to me, where the projectors could go next. So. For instance, in the work of Jean-Luc Godard, and if you compare this image you see here about a woman and the one we saw earlier of the pornographic image, maybe you get that already that idea, that for instance, for Jean-Luc Godard, cinema is a form that thinks. In contrast, for instance, to television that only shows what is already defined. So according to Godard, there's even nothing to see in the television image any longer. Neither reality nor image. People have forgotten how to look. So Godard argues, as makers we have to hand the public a key so they can start seeing again. And the method that Godard uses for this is the coexistence of just the positions. Fascination and aversion. So here again you see commodification cliches and the non cliché come together. So he tries to create a possibility of a world, a prospect of a world beyond the one we already know. He tries to help you to see, or as he says, create I images or a form that allows you to think. And I think also that uh, the work of Kohlhaas, the Casa de Musico, for instance, is a kind of spatial psychology and a kind of spatial form which is not representing a metaphor or, or an already known cliché, but it's a kind of technique where you, it's a form that thinks, that allows you to discover. So, of course, I think the approach I'm looking for is a very tough approach, but I think, and I think it can be done much more than only Rem Kohlhaas is doing, but I think most people don't understand what he's trying to do, or at least my reading of it, so there, are, there is much more to do than only he does. It's actually surprising that not more people are doing it. Uh, is that, let me see, for instance, in film, and when you look to film, there is a huge tradition of what they call the free indirect style, the free indirect reason. It's also something which we find in literature, which we hardly see or is discussed yet as a kind of technique for architecture. And uh, the free indirect style is in fact that there is always a, a kind of a third layer. So Hollywood is not applying the free indirect style. There you follow one person and you identify with this person and when the person experiences horror you cry, etc. etc. So it's a kind of hypnosis, you drag into the story. For instance, uh, what the screen rate style is, is there's a certain distanciation. Suddenly, the main character, for instance, can look at you and talk to you. Or there is a narrating 
level within the same, same film. So, when you, to, to give you a better example, to, I'm trying to speed up also, is that uh, Beckel Brecht defines the word gestus. What he means with gestus, and also people like Pasolini use that, that um, as an actor, you don't try to totally identify with that person. You don't become the person you play, but you're also yourself. So Brecht and Pasolini, for instance, they prefer to work with amateurs. So while you are yourself, you play the other, and the being playing out is being experienced. So what happens in one actor, and you see those in their play, in their gestures, is that there is a kind of constant mediation of who you are and what you play. And that relation between the, the fiction and the real invites the viewer to have an interpretation and to have different interpretations so you have a, a talk about it. So the idea of the gestures is, that, is one of the tools of the free indirect style. So the style itself, the formalism is not there for itself, but it's really a tool. And a lot of contemporary American architectures, the prototyping, etc., still put the method first and then, in fact, what it produced. Well, you, you don't need to see the methods, you have, you have to experience it before. So, you could say that, that this building breath, or this technique of breath, uh, you can find, for instance, in Kohlhaas, Porto building, you can find all kinds of traces of the ordinary, of the recognizable, conventional. And at the same time, uh, you are surprised. But it's not like in critical architecture where you're displaced, where you feel uncomfortable, where you no longer feel at home. No, in these buildings you feel very much at home because the conventions are even an enjoyment while they're at the same time being broken. So what you could say is that in these buildings, by Koha, there is a kind of... Um, language, maybe even an autonomous language, because it's not just what you recognize from uh, lifestyle or IKEA. Uh, so there is a, a, an a, autonomous tool, but this autonomy of the architectural language is not celebrating itself, but it's only there, or even suppressing itself in order to provoke you to have an interpretation and to, to have uh, different ways of using it. So, in Porto, you also find, maybe, you find a kind of delve blue, you find things you can relate to from your everyday life. But there's always a displacement, there's always an alienating effect, or a defamiliarization, which doesn't make you unfamiliar, like in critical architecture, but somehow it displaces you to start to see, to start to think, to, to have an interpretation. And that it could also relate to, let me see, that Benjamin calls that the psychoanalysis of seeing, as Walter Benjamin calls it in relation to film. And that also holds good for the Casa da Musica. The architect does not explain how you should behave, but creates possibilities and encourages different usages. A complex system of relation is created in the Casa da Musica and in relation to the city which ingeniously interact with, influence, and constantly interrogate the other. So in a way, you become a detective of your own story unfolding. And it's both educational and enjoying. So as I said, what I try to look for is a kind of alienating, or there is a kind of autonomy of architecture, but that Autonomy is not referring to itself or trying to recuperate architecture for its own good as an independent language, but it's really there to relate to, to the city and to relate to the public or even open up a public. Um, I'm trying to speed up because I'm talking too long. So you see through... A, so. What the problem is with fresh conservatism is that in the end it generates consensus. And that is a kind of politics 
where what we see a lot in contemporary society where we try to manage the processes uh, and that the managing of these processes is actually there to normalize problematic things as soon as possible. And that is what you could call policing. And most politics today is about policing. It's about normalizing things which are abnormal. Uh, and I would say a lot of projects Mar Michael Speaks is advocating are in fact policing. They're normalizing uh, systems as quick as possible as uh, Rumsfeld also believes he's doing with his design intelligence in Iraq. Uh, and what I'm after is a kind of idea of politics where dissensus or disagreement in the system itself is essential to arrive at an idea of the public and of exchange. And uh, that means that there's always a questioning or a kind of dialogical space within the work of what the work wants to say and doesn't say, perhaps, in relation to the existing context and what it does. As you can see here, how it relates to the park and the city. Also, for instance, when you look to, to the section, which of course came from the original idea of the house, is that you have maybe... A, on the side, in, there's the plane of consistency, which is the public space, which is the performance you can uh, experience collectively. But on the sidelines of that, we see all kinds of also rhizomatic moves around the building. So there are many chapters, there are many interpretations and way of going about through the building. And that is a richness, because you allow all kinds of individual experience to be. And at the same time, you introduce a kind of collective or a plane of consistency, which I would say, in this building, is the reinvention of the idea of the public. And that is exactly not about the policing society, which is very much about surveillance and control. And that happens, I think, now in a very advanced and challenging manner. So, I'm really looking for heterogeneity systems to conclude which are not just about endless con contradictions or exposing all kinds of contradictions as we see here along the highway in Graz. But I'm really looking for a kind of uh, politics or systems of dissensus with disagreement within the system. Uh, that's the thing. When you have this kind of freestyle method, uh, you need something else, and I mentioned already, and it's directionality. And what you could see in the work of Brecht, and also in Kohlhaas, is that there is, in each project chosen, there is something that you also have to address urgencies. You have to address things which lack, or cliches that are closed. You have to break them open up to arrive at possibility of freedom. So, the projector is hardly ever talking, because it's so busy with trying to formulate a new language, is not linking that to what kind of urgent problems there are really in society, uh, and what kind of things of minorities should be opened up. And with minorities, I don't only talk uh, about that we should deal with the immigrants, etc. It's not, that, not only that kind of politics, but it's also, uh, like Godard said, you can develop forms that think. So the way you go up the stair, meet the other, meet the unknown, meet the unexpected, uh, go beyond the surveillance systems within the building, seeing the city differently with the view, like in the Porto building, for instance, you can look back from the concert hall into the city again. There are all kinds of things of what is normally suppressed allows to be opened. Thank you very much.